In this video, which has been sponsored by The Great Courses Plus, but more of that later, I'm going to be talking about the effectiveness, or perhaps the ineffectiveness, of bombardment upon the enemy with bombs and artillery and all that sort of stuff in modern warfare. Now, uh, there was the infamous Day of the Typhoon. Yes, the Day of the Typhoon. Doesn't that sound good? On this day, uh, uh, the British were advancing against the Germans, but the Germans were trying to counterattack, and they were sending tanks to the front. Uh, the British were going forward from the, the Normandy area, and they ruled the skies. Yes, the British had achieved almost total uh, air superiority, and though hundreds of sorties were flown with the Typhoon ground attack planes, and these, these had cannons and machine guns and so forth, but they also had rockets. Eight rockets, four on each wing. Now, these are eight-inch rockets, so that's eight times eight-inch. A cruiser at the time typically had about eight eight-inch guns, so one of these typhoons coming at you and shooting all its rockets at you was equivalent to being on the receiving end of the, a broadside from a cruiser. So pretty terrifying, I think you'd agree. And the day of the typhoon went down in, in, in history as the time when 89 kills were racked up to the RAF, or at least 89 kills were claimed by the RAF. But then later, when inspectors on the ground uh, went forward over the area that had been fought over and looked for these 89 wrecks that had been blasted to smithereens by rockets, that's not actually what they found. They found 10 that they were pretty confident had been knocked out by rockets. There were, there were marks of, of rocket hits on them, nothing else that would explain that the, uh, the uh, vehicle had been knocked out. So yes, okay, so 10 that could be confidently clocked up to rocket hits. Perhaps others had been hit by rockets but not knocked out or had been towed away, so those didn't get uh, recorded. But 10, yeah, 10 definite kills. And another 10 which it seemed had been abandoned whilst being rocketed. Uh, so there were rocket hits all around, the vehicle didn't seem to be really knocked out exactly, but clearly it was abandoned, the crew had, had scarpered. Um, so that leaves an awful lot of gap to bring it up to 89, but it seems that a very large number of Germans had just decided to be somewhere else in their tanks. You can imagine, can't you? You're, you're in a German tank, you've got the, your, 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 the radio on uh, in your headphones, and you hear, oh, one of my colleagues has just been knocked out. Uh, oh, and another. And oh, and here come typhoons. And ooh, they fly over the top. And, and what do you do? You can just hope that they miss you, and then you've lost contact with another load of your guys, and you just think, I don't want to be here. Pretty quickly the Germans uh, twigged that it was the uh, tanks that the RAF were, were targeting, so if you were in a tank and a load of uh, typhoons turned up, suddenly you really didn't want to be there anymore, so you would hide or, and or run away. And as long as the Germans are busy hiding and running away in their tanks, then they're not busy fighting at the front in their tanks. So the job's being done. You are effectively depriving the Germans of tank support even if you're not actually hitting the tanks. Now, how often did they hit the tanks? Well, it seems that something like one rocket in a hundred might actually hit a tank, and that if the rockets were, were fired competently and properly, then they were landing within about 150 yards of the target. The trouble is that tanks, though terribly large, are not 150 yards wide. And if you think of a, a circle of 150 yards in diameter, then an awful lot of places in that circle you can put a tank where a rocket is not going to hit it. And if you're in a tank, of course, and a rocket misses even quite nearby, um, you're probably fine. You're in an armoured box. So if you're a crewman in a tank, you might think, well, I'll just stay in this armoured box. Yeah, but if three typhoons come at you, each with eight rockets, <laughs> that's roughly a 22% chance of being hit. It's coming on for one in four. It's, is, are those odds that you, you fancy? One in four chance, if you just sit in your iron box, that you're going to be blown up? No, maybe you'd rather be somewhere else. So you might abandon and leg it, or you might just drive your tank somewhere else. So the day of the typhoon was not anything like as effective in the number of tanks that were actually killed by rockets, and yet it seems that it was still fairly effective. And also, it's good for morale, too, when you see loads of typhoons mm. swirling around overhead and... and not so many German tanks around, so you think, yeah, if you're a British infantryman going forward, this seems like a fairly good day. The day of the typhoon, even though not many of those rockets actually hit. And they said, the same could be said of an awful lot of um, bombardment. Uh, for instance, there was, at the same stage in the war, there was a, a 500 yard long viaduct that became a, a priority target for the RAF, and they attacked it over and over again and again afterwards when inspectors went to actually see how many bombs had hit it, and they knew how many bombs had been uh, uh, dropped on it, they found out that one in 82 bombs had actually hit the target. 
So you might think, well, these pilots are a bit rubbish. I mean, it's a 500-yard-long target. How difficult can it be? Don't they practice? Well, yes, th they did practice, and I'm sure they were a great deal more accurate when they weren't being shot at. Now, imagine, let's imagine that the, the viaduct is straight. So there's a pretty obvious line along which you would want to fly. You would want to fly directly in line with the viaduct, wouldn't you? So that your left and right is pretty much catered for, and if you're a little bit short or long, it's not going to matter. You can hit the viaduct anyway because it's 500 yards long. Yeah, but any German gunner with a machine gun is going to work that out, unless he's an idiot. So all he has to do is aim a stream of bullets along that line straight over the viaduct, and anyone trying to fly along that line is going to fly through that stream of bullets. So when you are being shot at and you're jinking and swerving and around all over the place trying to uh, avoid being hit, you're going to end up doing a bombing run that's a sort of swooping thing like that at an awkward angle, and yep, only one in 82 bombs will actually hit the target. Um, but you might think, well, with, with artillery, surely it's much better with artillery because they're, they're set up and they've got charts and tables and they can fire shell after shell and, and, and walk things onto the target with Ford observers and it, it's better, right? Yeah, but it's still, it might surprise you just how inaccurate an awful lot of artillery was. Now, uh, in a, an early attack uh, against Germany um, in 1945, a fairly studied attack, it was found that fewer than 5% of the shells fired landed within 50 yards of a point target. By point target, I mean, uh, it's not an area they're trying to hit. It's not, it's not a, a big barrage of an area. They're trying to hit a particular gun emplacement or something. So against a point target, only 5% were getting within 50 yards. When the Canadians uh, were attacking, uh, what was it, Bologna, uh, they fired, what well, they managed to, I don't know how many they fired actually, but they managed to land 6,000 shells within 150 yards of uh, a, a German AA battery that had eight guns firing away. So at 6,000 artillery shells uh, landing within roughly the accuracy of a properly fired rocket from a typhoon, they managed to knock out just two of those uh, anti-aircraft guns, or putting it another way, they managed to knock out two of the anti-aircraft guns. But here's the, you might say, surprising thing. The other six carried on firing, despite two of them being knocked out in this tremendous barrage of thousands of shells coming at them, the other six were able somehow to carry on firing. So, um, uh, in, in 1945, when the British were going forward, that same study I mentioned before calculated that they fired um, half a million shells in one operation and killed 60 of the enemy. Half a million shells to kill just 60 of the enemy. It's beginning to look, isn't it, as though this bombardment stuff is just useless, it's just rubbish, it doesn't kill anyone. Um, well, I put it to you that actually killing people should not be the, the object. If you think that something has failed because it didn't hit, because it didn't kill, then I think you're missing the point. The object, surely, is not to kill people. In fact, wouldn't it be nice if we could avoid killing people? The object is to win the war. And you win wars not by killing absolutely everyone on the other side, particularly something like World War II. Just think of the scale. Um, what you do is you persuade the enemy to stop fighting. So how do you persuade the enemy to stop fighting? Well, you've got to get him to surrender. So uh, what you would like then is some sort of um, contagious behaviour. Because though it is occasionally the case that uh, commanders from on high order very large numbers of men to surrender all at once. So for instance, the obvious uh, example, the fall of Singapore. British High Command ordered 60,000 British to surrender and they obeyed orders and they surrendered. The biggest um, defeat for the British of all time. Um, but usually in a war, it's small numbers, perhaps one platoon, a company at most, taking prisoners of uh, small numbers of the enemy. And so you've got to find out some localised way of getting guys to surrender because surrendering is contagious, whereas death is not contagious. If uh, uh, I'm here in a position with a load of my uh, uh, men in, in, in my unit and I see over there, forward and left of us, uh, there's another uh, lot of us and they get attacked by the enemy and they are all killed, I don't think to myself, yeah, dying, yeah, that's a good idea, should we give that a go? It's not a contagious behaviour. People don't die because other people have died. But if I see that lot surrender and they... Uh, they show white flags and then the enemy stops shooting at them and then there's a parley and they're led away and everything seems to be quite amicable and no one is, at least while I'm watching, mistreated and I think, well, phew, that, that all seemed to be quite orderly. So actually these guys 
are disciplined enough to accept a surrender and will uh, stop shooting if you offer surrender. And okay, and so now this seems like a viable behavior. Maybe we should surrender. I mean, there are an awful lot of them, and so we're probably likely to lose. And it seems that they will give us an opportunity to surrender. So if that opportunity is offered to us, then maybe we should take it as well. Surrendering is a, a, a possibly contagious behavior. And if you can get more and more guys to surrender, then then it snowballs and then eventually you've won the war. Hooray. So if you can persuade people to surrender rather than killing them, it's actually better. So maybe we should look more at the psychological effects of bombardment. You see, it wasn't until about World War I that uh, the military finally twigged that the main effect of bombardments is psychological. Um, it was discovered, for instance, that if you could kill 5% of the opposition, then the fighting effectiveness of the opposition would be halved. Okay, so if there are a thousand troops over there and you kill 50 of them, then the uh, remaining troops will fight as effectively as just 500, not 950. And if you can kill 10% of them, then their fighting effectiveness goes down to approaching zero. Of course, you can never guarantee this, but in the main, it goes down to approaching zero. Now, I strongly suspect that that's not because of the actual killing. I don't think it's because you've killed one tenth of them that the others uh, are incapable of carrying on fighting. I think it's got far more to do with what you have to do in order to kill 10% of them is what renders the, 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 the other 90% incapable or at least unwilling uh, to resist you. So by the time you've hit them with so much ordnance, so so many loud bangs, so many flying splinters of death all over the place, you, you, enough to kill 10% of them, then the effect of all that renders the other 90% stuff it. I'm, I'm not going to fight. I've had enough of this. Um, so how can, we, how can we measure fear then? Well, unfortunately, there is no reliable way of measuring it. Um, you could say, oh, well, surely there are correlates of it. What about heart rate? Yeah, well, heart rate uh, goes up and down and up and down all over the shop. You can't keep very high heart rates uh, going for, for long periods of time, such as the length of uh, time that modern battles tend to last. Um, one man's heart rate may go up and down in quite a different pattern to another's. And are you really going to try to measure loads of people's heart rates while there's a war on? Uh, it has to be real fear, right? So it has to be a real war. Um, that experiment uh, just doesn't work. Um, and it doesn't tell you anything what you want to know. Um, some men will be absolutely terrified, but they will still fight effectively. They feel the fear, but fight anyway. So it doesn't actually tell you very much about how they'll behave as soldiers either. So it's not that useful. Some men will run, some will, st will stand and fight, and others will just cower in terror. Now, in 1917, a study was done about the danger to men in bombardments, and it was found that Obviously, these figures are very, um, are very convenient and, and round, but it was found that if you are standing upright, you are 10 times more likely to become a casualty if you're in a bombardment uh, than if you're lying on the ground. Now, one of the things you have to do in order to run is stand up. So you could try to run through a barrage in order to escape with your life, or you could just lie down. And statistically, you're much more likely to live if you just lie down. But of course, then you don't feel as though you're in control. You just have to lie there and hope that you don't get hit. But statistically, yeah, just lie down. It's better. But if you can get into a trench, oh, in a trench, you're a hundred times safer. So if you're immediately next to a trench, just jump into the trench. Um, but if you're in a bunker, you're a thousand times safer. So yes, if you are in a trench, then it is probably worth moving, but only to go deeper underground into the bunker. But then, of course, you get bunker mentality. I'm not coming out. You feel safe in the bunker. And um, there is something called a, a barrage hangover. So um, uh, a load of shells are fired at the enemy and the enemy gets suppressed by those uh, shells. Um, and then the barrage stops. So do they immediately pop up fresh as daisies or is there this barrage hangover? Uh, are they now sluggish and delayed in their reactions and less likely to fight? Do they have a barrage hangover? Now, uh, in World War I, what you got was something called the, the race to the parapet. So you have a, a load of guys here who have been uh, shelled for some while and they're deep in their bunker 
and you've got a load of guys here in their trenches who are, have been ordered to uh, attack as soon as the, the barrage lifts. So the barrage lifts, these guys start running across no man's land. They've got quite a bit of dif distance to cover and they've got maybe shell holes and barbed wire and all the rest of it as well. Uh, these guys have got a much shorter distance to the parapet, but are they going to just set off immediately? Because when the barrage stops, are they convinced it stopped? Is this just a lull? Is it going to start again any moment? And how are they psychologically? Are they fresh as daisies? No, probably not. They've just been shelled for ages. Um, and they have some problems of their own. They may find that they have to dig their way out, for instance, of their bunker because the trench might have collapsed uh, near the entrance. So and then they've got to get into the trench and then they've got to go along the trench and find their place and set up the machine guns and, and clean all the mud and all the damage off them. There's a delay. And so that was the race to the parapet and whoever got to the parapet first tended to win. Uh, so in World War I that was the, the decider of a lot of uh, fights in, on the classic Western Front trenches, no man's land and all the rest of it. Now what does a sane man do? Well immediately a sane man goes, oh, the barrage has lifted, we must man the guns and he hastens to the guns. But how sane is he? Uh, how, how willing is he to fight? Well, more calculations were done and it was found that if you fired one artillery shell uh, of presumably medium size, it, it does make a difference um, uh, what the size of the shell is, uh, one or two every minute and it lands within about 200 yards of a soldier, um, then that will keep him in cover. He won't venture out. Uh, but to stop him firing back, is quite important. So to suppress him so much that he doesn't actually head up and, and, and fire accurately back, you need six shells every minute landing within about 200 yards. Now, if you want to cause the enemy's resolve to collapse, the step up, so it's one or two to get them in cover, six to get them to uh, stop shooting, but it's a vast amount of ordnance you need then to cause them to, to, uh, to cause their resolve to collapse. Meanwhile, can I contrast this uh, with uh, figures from military exercises, modern military exercises, where um, troops don't even go to ground unless they've taken 10 to 20 percent casualties. Whereas it was discovered, and we were reminded again in the Falklands, but so just one burst of machine gun fire and, and even if they're elite troops like Paris, everybody hits the deck. Um, when there are actual hurty bits of lead uh, flying about, uh, people get uh, much less brave than they do on military exercises. So. Um, military exercises unfortunately really just don't model reality terribly well. Now uh, in 1945 um, uh, when the British attacked uh, the German village of Bauchen, uh, it's, well, it's 1945, let's, let's, let's just think of what that means for a moment. Uh, by the time 1945 comes around the British have been going forwards every single day since the Normandy landings and the Germans have been retreating every single day and it's obvious to the British going forwards that the war's over now. So whereas when you were on the Normandy beaches on D-Day itself it seemed worth taking a risk to, to save the lives of the fellows around you and, and to make sure that this operation succeeds because if this operation fails, oh my goodness the stakes, the number of people who are going to die, it really is worth fighting on D-Day. But by the time 1945 comes around and it's pretty obvious the Germans really have lost now, nobody wants to die. I mean I'm not saying that people on D-Day wanted to die but they weren't willing to take risks anymore because Oh, well, you know, the war's almost over. The Germans, have, uh, it's just a few days now. Surely they're going to be throwing in the towel. No one wants to be the last guy to die. Um, meanwhile, of course, uh, by this time, the, the Allies have got more than a, a toehold, more than a foothold. They've jumped into Europe and they've landed loads and loads of munitions. They no longer have to be anything like as conserving of ammunition as once was the case. So even though orders were against this sort of thing, they would expend vast amounts of ordnance to achieve uh, quite um, modest aims. So the village was uh, defended by only about 150 men and they hit it with everything in the kitchen sink. Uh, they, in a 10 minute period, they fired 49 tons of high explosive at it. 49 tons. And uh, I've been told that um, uh, barrages, they, they sound like barking dogs, the, the rhythm of poof, ruff, 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 ba, 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 that sort of weird um, rhythm that uh, barking dogs have. Um, and so you've got that, that deafening your ears and, and just 
causing terror and causing you to go to ground and it just goes on 49 tons and then they were able to bring up a load of mortars and another 44 tons of mortar shells rain down on this village and then they brought up tanks and AA guns and another 18 tons 18 tons can you imagine that the, the, the tanks were to fired off pretty much everything they had and then gone back for more another 18 tons of ordnance fired direct into that village and then for an encore a half hour long barrage of another 73 tons of ordnance just crashing into that village. So now in World War I, if you just take the amount of high explosive used and the number of men uh, killed, you get one ton per man. It took roughly a ton of high explosive to kill a man in World War I. So this was 184 tons and there are 150 men there. So it'll kill everyone right? All dead. Must be. I mean, nobody could live through that. So when the, the, the Dorsets regiment uh, went in, the infantry, they found no resistance. But only 25 men had been killed in the barrage. Now, that's, that's a lot. That's still 17% losses, but it's an awful lot less than 100%. But those remaining were in no state to offer any resistance at all. They their minds had just been shattered by this, frankly, even at the time it was considered overkill. This vast amount of ordnance landing on them had utterly shattered their ability to resist. It was found at that period that if they could kill 3% of the opposition with a barrage, then what followed was almost always uh, classed as an easy victory. Uh, but this was, yeah, <clears throat> overkill a bit. Now, what stops people fighting back? Well, being dead, obviously. Uh, so, but for every man who cannot offer any resistance after the bombardment because he's dead, two are so terrified that they can't offer any resistance. And about five are too sensible to try. Um, they, they haven't completely lost their wits under normal circumstances. Obviously, Balcom was a, an extreme example. Um, but uh, they are just too, they, they've done the calculation in their head. It's just not worth it. If the enemy's got this amount of stuff and then on top of this, it's, we're going to be attacked by infantry, oh, forget it. I'll, it I'm, I'm going to surrender or leave. I'm not going to fight. So even the sane are very likely to be defeated uh, by, uh, by bombardment. So it's not useless bombarding because the effect is largely psychological. Now, so far, uh, this video has been rather grim and maybe I should lighten the tone a bit. Uh, so I shall. And I shall say it's sponsor time. Yes, it's sponsor time. It is sponsor time. Sponsor time. Yes, it's sponsor time. It's sponsor time. But uh, I, I thought I uh, just give mention of this. It's a ukulele that has been very kindly sent to me by one of my viewers, uh, one Michael Harter from um, the US of A. Thanks, Mike. It's 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 glossy and it's got inlay and it goes. Uh, that was a C. And, and if some of you are thinking, well, <clears throat> frankly, I, I wasn't impressed by that ukulele uh, bit of playing there. I, I think if he's going to try to show off, oh, I can play the ukulele, then maybe you should ought to get a bit better than that. Well, in my defense, this arrived about two hours ago and I've watched one five minute video on how to play the ukulele. Uh, first, I had to tune it. It's got really weird tuning. I, I'm used to pianos and guitars and so forth where, well, the idea where each string um, is higher than the one before it. But this one uh, uh, starts high, then goes low, then goes a little bit uh, higher and then almost as, uh, just a little bit higher than the first one. High, low, medium, slightly higher, which uh, confuses the heck out of me. Anyway, um, possibly this will feature in future videos and maybe I can motivate myself to learn to play it by um, um, just saying that I'm not allowed to use it in a future video unless I've learned a new chord or, I don't know, something new. Anyway, thanks, Mike. Um, now then, oh yes, sponsor time, that was it. And this is sponsored by The Great Courses Plus. Now, if you're unfamiliar with The Great Courses Plus, let me tell you. It's a huge reserve of human knowledge, expert human knowledge as well, uh, professors and so forth from distinguished universities and, and they have people from the National Geographic and the Smithsonian and, and you know, august um, uh, bodies such as those. And there are, last time I looked, over 11 thousand lectures available and so you know with that number you really can't come up with the excuse oh, there's nothing I'm interested in there'll be something and you get if you go to www. 
thegreatcoursesplus.com stroke Lindy Beige access to a free trial, one month of unlimited access to as much of it as you like. And if you like it, then you can pay a subscription, then you will have a continuing unlimited access and to all that knowledge. And remember, that there are no exams. That's one of the great things. There'll be no exams. You might think, oh, more school. Ah, oh, but no exams at the end of it. So it's just knowledge and knowledge is good. Um, so you can go to uh, the uh, the URL that I've just given you, or it's much easier if you just click uh, the, the link in the description. Always easier, do that, it's at the top of the description, should find it quite easily. Um, new stuff is being added monthly. Oh, and uh, news for the people in the UK and Australia, uh, it is now optimised. So in the past, some uh, people had uh, reported that they were having a bit of trouble paying, but now it should be smooth and easy. Optimised, in fact. And optimised sounds terribly good. I mean, it's a bit like the word optimal. Uh, now, uh, I, uh, of course, uh, wanted something to do with artillery because, you know, some, or bombardment or whatever, and I typed those words in and, oh, you know what it's like, you go into the rabbit hole. And anyway, I ended up on um, uh, a course about do-it-yourself engineering, uh, in which I saw a very enthusiastic professor who was clearly very pleased with these very nice wooden models that he'd made of uh, an onager and a ballista and a trebuchet. The arms of the trebuchet were about, about that long. Um, and being a professor, there are two lectures on, on the making of these. Being a professor, of course, he, he's got equations and, and graphs and so forth of, for optimizing uh, your, your bits of artillery uh, and, and the like. So if you are interested in, admittedly, it's not modern artillery, it's ancient artillery. Hey, but it's artillery and you're watching a video about artillery, so you might be interested in ancient artillery and it's making stuff which I happen to quite like. Uh, so um, that's a do-it-yourself engineering, which is one of the many, many lectures that you can gain access to on The Great Courses Plus, my generous sponsor. Thank you. Uh, now, uh, back to, uh, I won't, I won't, I've, got, I'll, I've got to get back to the grimness now, the grimness of artillery. You see, artillery really is horrible. I mean, it is, it, it, it's, it's sharp shards of metal being flung left, right and centre. It's incredibly loud noises. It's, um, it's terror. Um, it's, it's something to be avoided if you can, but it's also extremely effective. Uh, it's an effective stick, if you like, but it's always good to have a carrot as well. And the carrot of, of surrender or escape, those are good carrots. Maybe, rather than trying to kill everyone uh, with more and more effective artillery, uh, which is the way that the, a lot of the modern military seems to be going, maybe we should be using tactical psychology to, to improve uh, our techniques, and you could call those techniques a form of technology, I suppose, in getting people to do what we want to do, which is to surrender, or at least run away. I mean, run away is good, but surrender is even better because then they don't get to fight another day. Um, now, if you want to sell a piece of kit to a general today, if you can prove it's phenomenally accurate and deadly, then whoa, that's a great bit of kit. I want one of those. Oh, this drone that drops this amazing missile that can go down a chimney and so forth. Yeah, that's great. And they're really good for killing people. And uh, the British Army today, and certainly the American Army, and I dare say quite a few other armies like them, have become really amazingly good at killing people, but not necessarily good at winning wars. In Afghanistan, was that easy? I mean, we had loads of troops with much better kit uh, and we we're up against a ill-led, ill-coordinated, ill-equipped um, ramshackle forces and yet did the, did the Allies win? Did the Coalition win? Did the Americans and British win? I, I don't think many people will, would, would argue that. In fact, uh, if, you, if you look at it uh, from the point of view of a, a killing scoreboard, oh yeah, absolutely, the British soldiers were killing 20 uh, of the enemy for every uh, one of their, their own that got killed. 20 to 1. Oh, yeah, that's, that's, that's absolutely, definitely victory. And yet, can you say that the war was a victory? Um, maybe we have to look at the psychology of war and, and the winning of it rather than the, 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 the kit that can just kill people. Um, it is often said that if you kill uh, someone in the Taliban or whatever, who, of course, is someone's uncle, is someone's dad, is someone's brother, what this does is it creates two new recruits to the Taliban in vengeance for that death. So killing people seems to be, if anything, counterproductive. Now, what do 
what, what, can we, what can we do to make barrages more effective? Well, um, study them a bit more uh, and possibly even experiment with them a bit more, though that may seem like a, a callous form of experimentation, but you've got to get the maximum value out of these things. Ideally, surely, you want to be killing the smallest number of people because death is horrible um, and having the greatest psychological effect. So, some will say that a short, sharp shock is more effective than a, a, a more spread out uh, long-term barrage. And there are occasions, there are contexts in which that seems to be the case. Um, however, there are other contexts where it seems not to be the case. And we've got to work out just when one type of barrage is more appropriate than the other. So what you can do is you can train people to sit tight, to sit still. And the longer you train them to do that, the longer their, their uh, barrage hangover will be, the longer they will continue to sit still. So if you launch a few shells, the guys sit tight in their, in, their, in their bunkers, in their trenches, whatever, and you continue to do this, they will, they will continue, okay, I'll just sit here, I'll just sit here, and then they get in, in, in a mindset of just sitting there. That's what they're going to do now. And then when you do lift the barrage, they continue to sit, which is usually to your advantage if you're trying to attack them at the time. Uh, so what do men do during a barrage? Well, it does seem to depend largely on how busy they are and how isolated they are. If men are in company and busy, they tend to carry on doing whatever it is that they were doing. Their, their task has momentum. So there are men in the bunker system and they're, they're, they're going through tunnels and they're moving um, uh, ammunition from one place to another. And then some of them are trying to, to hack through a wall with pickaxes so they can get into another bit of the, of, of the underground complex. Other guys are trying to rig up uh, uh, repairs to the air filtration system because it's getting really foul down there. They've got stuff to do and they're with other people who will notice if they've stopped doing whatever it is that they were doing. And there'll be officers perhaps supervising them and, and saying, carry on doing the thing that you're doing. And so they tend to, even as the barrage continues, they carry on doing the thing that they're doing. Meanwhile, um, in a less regarded room, there might be a dozen guys. Uh, yes, they're in company, but they're just sitting tight. They're just sitting tight and they're doing nothing. Um, and if an officer comes along and tries to get them to do something, uh, uh, you lot, uh, there's a thing I need you to do, I need you to do this, right, okay, right, I've got other things to do, and off you go, uh, ten minutes later, but hang on, you're all just sitting here, I told you ten minutes ago you should be doing the thing, why aren't you doing the thing, come on, do the thing, right, uh, and they just sit tight, maybe if you put a lot of effort into one man, or you, you, I told you, or the direct order, come on, get out there, and you put a lot of effort into getting him to do a thing, then he'll do the thing, but the others will, oh great, he's doing the thing, we'll just continue to sit tight. I've heard this likened to trying to throw drunks out of a bar. It takes a huge amount of effort and you can't really motivate them all in one go. You have to work on one and then work on the next and then work on the next and hope that the first one then doesn't come back in again. Huh. So there's that mentality. There is another mentality which tends to be isolated men. If a man is on his own, and he's in the barrage that just carries on and it's terrifying. He doesn't know what's going on elsewhere. He hasn't, uh, he's not being supervised by an officer. He's not being encouraged by um, his, his, uh, his, his fellows. And uh, he's not being given a reason to be brave because generally you need to be seen to be brave because you're putting on a brave face for others. You're being brave, but there's no, why, why be brave? No one's watching me. So they, quite often lapse into a catatonic state. Some of them go sort of limp and some of them go really, really tense, but they stare into space and they are, as soldiers, completely useless once they've gone into that state. But a lot of people, they just sort of adapt. Now, there's the long-term adaption, which I've read about many, many times. I've lost count of the number of times that are reading memoirs that I've read of soldiers who slept through a barrage. And they're not even deep underground in bunkers. Some of these guys, in fact, they're usually, in the accounts that I've been reading, they're usually just in a slit trench out in the open, and yet they've slept through a barrage because they've, they've been shelled so many times before and they know there's nothing they can do. So they just get on with some sleep because you never know, if you're in the army and you're on campaign, you never know when your next opportunity to sleep will be, so take the opportunity to sleep, and they will sleep through a barrage. Um, and possibly what wakes them up is the barrage lifting. Oh, the enemy might be attacking now. Um, but there's, there's another sort of more short-term uh, adaption, which is that, uh, yes, when uh, the danger is, is close and threatening. Bang! Uh, the, the explosions start around you. Yes, you get the higher heart rate, you get the adrenaline, you get, you're get you pumped up for action. But then, if this doesn't lead to anything, there's only so long that your body will keep that up for. And after a while, your body stops making a fuss. Uh, and I strongly suspect that this is because we are biologically not capable of sustaining 
uh, that ready for action uh, in this stressful moment um, state of body uh, because in the environment in which we evolved, the EEA, the environment of evolutionary adaption back in the Pleistocene, there was no threat that was sustained for ages. If you're about to fall off a cliff, you scramble like crazy and you either fall off the cliff and die or you make it to safety and then you're fine. In which case you can oh, calm down. If you're attacked by a tiger, yes, absolutely, you want, you want to be uh, ready for, for, for action and, and to fight like crazy, but no tiger is continually attacking you for hours. So um, there is no point in evolving the ability to stay pumped up for hours and hours. And so if a barrage goes on for hours and hours, troops get used to it and they start calming down. Now, um, artillery, as I say, is, is horribly effective. Um, and, and in modern warfare, in, well, in World War II, most casualties were caused by artillery. It was something like four-fifths during the Normandy breakout period in, in 1944 between the, the Allies and the Germans. About four-fifths of casualties were being caused by artillery because you pin troops, you stop them moving, and then you hit them with artillery. And, and whilst that's going on, other men are not firing their rifles. It's the artillery that's doing the work. So artillery causes a lot of casualties. Now, during the Falklands uh, conflict, that's conflict, by the way, not Falklands War. Um, the Falklands wasn't a war, it was a conflict. Uh, it was called the Falklands Crisis until the shooting started, and then it was the Falklands Conflict. Um, no war was ever declared. Britain never declared war on Argentina. Argentina didn't declare war on Britain. There was no plan by the British to invade Argentina or even to overthrow the fascist junta that was uh, ordering the, the invasion. No, uh, it was a policing action. It was a conflict. Um, and it was one that, that the entire world recognised. So even the Russians, can I remind you, this was 1982, so we're still deep in the Cold War at this point. This is long before Perestroika and Glasnost. Even the Russians uh, didn't veto it. That, yeah, yeah, in the UN, actually, yeah, fair enough. Yeah, the Argentinian fascist junta probably shouldn't have done that. Um, and I realise I'm going on off a bit of a tangent uh, here. Uh, but can I just say, thanks, thanks New Zealand. New Zealand, they were the only people just about who came forward uh, to offer us help. And they said, do you want us some ships? And uh, as I recall, uh, the British uh, politely declined. But but yes, know who your friends are. Thanks, New Zealand. That's that's friendship and loyalty. I, I like that. Uh, but anyway, point is that it was a conflict, not a war. And people only started calling it a war after the British had won, which I think is a little bit dishonourable because I think they started calling it a war because it just sounds better to have won a war Oh, we've carried out a successful policing action. We've resolved a military conflict. Doesn't sound as good as we've won a war. And so people, um, as far as I know around the world, but certainly within Britain, started calling it the Falklands War uh, just as, as soon as the British had won, which I think is, yeah, that's not really, that's not really cricket. Um, uh, anyway, 1982. So during the Falklands uh, conflict, uh, there was an attack on Wireless Ridge, and this was defended by Argentinians, and they were entrenched and they were hit by artillery. Uh, now, they suffered something getting on for 20% losses uh, from artillery, and almost all their losses uh, were from artillery. Um, and uh, just to, <clears throat> uh, to, to balance the books a bit, the, uh, the paras who were attacking them, about half of their losses were also to artillery. The same artillery, the, 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 the British artillery. Oops. Uh, well, twas ever thus. Um, but... Uh, they, the, the, it was a, a, a victory for the, the paras going forwards, but the paras didn't actually have to do a huge amount with bullets and bayonets. Uh, they just had to get there and round up any prisoners or, or secure the position because an awful lot of the Argentinians had bugged out. That is to say, legged it. That was the, the bugged out was the, the phrase used at the time. Uh, they, they'd, they'd scarpered, they'd gone. And they did this largely because of an unintentional lull in the barrage. By the way, I think one of the reasons that the barrage was quite so deadly uh, was that uh, artillery between 1945 and 1982 had got quite a bit more accurate. And another being that the Argentinian trenches weren't that great. Uh, they weren't quite the, the marvellous structures that the, uh, the British and Germans were digging in, um, in, uh, in, in Flanders in World War I. Uh, but I think that was partly because the soil wasn't so deep anyway. Um, most of, the, uh, artil most of the casualties on both sides uh, were caused by artillery and um, it was the lull which got the Argentinians to, to escape. And yeah, there are other examples. For instance, when the, when the British were attacking Rio de Castel, no, Castel de Rio, bigger pardon, in Italy, uh, and this is back, going back to World War II now, 
uh, they did what was called a, a, um, a bite and hold attack and they fired the usual number about 4,000 shells at the enemy and then stormed in en masse and were repulsed by the determined German defenders who saw them off. So the British then regrouped and rather than just repeat the same thing they said well, let's try a different approach. So this time uh, they fired just uh, one shell every three minutes for seven hours. So imagine you're on the receiving end of a shell every three minutes for hour after hour after hour and you know the British are out there and you know they're going to try again. What are you going to do? Well a second uh, assault was uh, was organized and in they went and they met almost no resistance at all. I think the two Germans had stayed back to fight but the others were just surrendering or the vast majority of them had just gone. And why had they gone? They'd gone because they could. Uh, one shell every three minutes is just a constant reminder you're in danger you're in danger, the next one might get you, the next one might get you, the next one might get you, the next one, oh, that one got someone, the next one might get you. But after a shell has come over, there's a gap, a gap where you feel reasonably safe. You balance the equation in your head, I'm probably more safe coming out of my trench and legging it in the open and getting away than I am staying where I am waiting to be attacked. And this is what happened. It was an, uh, an easy victory when the British went in after that thing. So 140 artillery shells, in that case, had achieved what 4,000 had not earlier in the same day. Now, during World Wars I and II, the British developed things called suppression charts. Uh, and uh, these were fairly, fairly widely used and got, I am told, by towards the end of World War II, actually pretty good because the British were getting actually quite good at tactical psychology uh, by the end of World War II. Um, and these were charts that an artilleryman might look at and, and uh, the planners might look at, and they, they gave you indications of how, how many shells of what calibre needed to be fired uh, with what rapidity and land within so many yards of a certain kind of target uh, to achieve a certain kind of effect, be it uh, getting them to sit tight, suppression or whatever. And uh, these were acted upon, but it seems that then the Cold War started and it was all about the Russians coming across in, in huge numbers and it was all about what ordnance can we get to knock out their tanks at what speed. It was, it was all about machines and killing and, uh, and attrition, wearing the enemy down by just killing lots of him. That all came back into the thinking and uh, the advances that the British had made in tactical psychology it seems uh, were largely thrown away and people stopped using these suppression charts. Now. Um, in, uh, let's go back to Afghanistan. If you are going to try to win a war like that uh, and you use methods to devise for another war, you probably find that they won't work so really well. In World War I it was all about massing a load of troops here and a huge amount of ordnance and crashing that on top of the enemy and then jumping on him before he had the chance to uh, pull himself back together again. But there there was a very definite front line. Uh, the enemies that uh, modern armies have been finding themselves up against don't fight with a, a front line somewhere and aren't organised in the way that, that the large armies were organised um, with a huge chain of command where large, uh, high commanders could, could order large numbers of troops to move or surrender or do whatever. If you're up against small numbers of insurgents with no front lines and you mass a huge amount of firepower in one place, well then they don't operate there, they go somewhere else. Unfortunately, the approach doesn't work. So um, that is what I have to say for the moment about bombardments.